Hi everybody, we're going to take a fairly quick look here at the bare bones introduction to the study of econometrics, right? So the assumption is we're just beginning that journey of studying econometrics. Uh, and what I want to do in these next couple videos is really kind of outline a roadmap for where this is going to be taking us, introducing a lot of the very useful notation that may be new to us. Um, and again, just kind of letting us know what the ultimate goal of this process is going to be. Uh, so this follows uh, information from chapters one and two from that Studentmund textbook. So when we talk about econometric data analysis, uh, a good question simply, well, what's the motivation? What are we trying to get out of this process? And not always the case, but ideally, uh, our goal is to simply add to our knowledge about how the world works, right? So my view of the ideal econometrician, right? It's kind of the wide-eyed, almost childlike scientist, right? Walking around, seeing economic phenomenon uh, occur in the world and asking the questions, you know, okay, why is that happening? What is it that's causing that outcome? Or kind of adding to our knowledge about, you know, simply how the economy works or verifying uh, claims that are made about how the economy works, right? So for example, uh, claims being made these days about if we, uh, as a government policy, increase the amount of payments to those who are unemployed, well, they're going to have a decreased incentive to work and unemployment would actually rise. Is that a causal effect that actually occurs? Well, if we do things right, we can test that claim. We won't do that today, but just as an example. Right? So certainly lofty goals of what we're going to try to accomplish uh, in this discipline bare bones foundations, uh, how do we accomplish that? Well, it all starts with asking the right questions, right? So having that wide-eyed view of the world, ask interesting questions that are tractable, right? That are going to have a, uh, an achievable answer given uh, technological and data constraints, right? So that's step number one. Think deeply about the questions that you're asking before you jump into running regressions and gathering data. But that's going to be the next step, right? So once you have the right question, well, then you've got to get the right data to match that question. And then, of course, you've got to know what to do with it, right? Knowing how to analyze it, knowing what econometric statistical tools are available to us, uh, how to use them, and how to interpret the results. So by the end of this journey, once you've kind of mastered the introductory level of econometrics, this is what will be available to you, right? So you'll be out there seeing an economic phenomenon. You want to know more about it. Formalize your question. Gather the correct data. Use the correct tools to analyze it. And you're off to the races. Right? So let's kind of take our first steps beginning this journey, right? And think a little bit more deeply about what this end result is going to look like. Uh, a good way to think about it is, you know, the world essentially is organized around mathematical relationships, right? There are prediction equations for every outcome that occurs. For example, unemployment, right? Month by month, how many people in the US economy are unemployed? Well, somewhere out there is an equation right, that predicts that outcome. We want to use our data, our sample available data, to come as close to that true prediction equation as possible. And once we know that, well, now we can see how each individual causal variable influences that outcome and whether or not there is, in fact, a causal effect uh, for the variable in question. Right. So I know it's kind of a, a deconstructionist way of looking at the world, but it's a very useful way of thinking about things. Every economic outcome out there has a prediction equation associated with it. The econometrician wants to find what that equation most likely looks like. Get a, as close an approximation as possible to that, uh, to that equation. So here's where we get into that idea of, of a road map, right? When we talk about applying these econometric models, econometric data uh, analysis techniques, ideally it should come in the form of a research agenda, which again started with that asking of a good question, right? So I'm being obviously a little bit naive here when I, when I pose this, but this is how we like to think of the classic econometrician operating. And we'll, we'll kind of look at counterexamples uh, uh, in a minute. 
but these uh, applied econometric research steps uh, should look something like this, right? And here's, again, where I'm being naive, but we should start with a theoretical foundation, right? So whether it's analyzing unemployment or uh, individual level education, economic growth across countries, whatever the case is, we should think deeply about what existing economic theory tells us about that variable, that phenomenon that we're investigating. And from that, we should be able to formulate a specific hypothesized model, right? And that's going to be the where we apply our, our data, okay? But notice that steps one and two, thinking deeply about the theory, formulating a process uh, that we believe explains what we're looking at, uh, and then formulating a specific ideal mathematical equation, none of this involves data at this point, right? So we haven't uh, looked at a single, a single observation of data, let alone uh, doing any analysis. But that's where we're going next, of course. So once we formulate that model, we know what we're looking for, then we've got a good idea of what the ideal data set is going to look like, as opposed to starting from having data dropped at our lap and then saying, what can this data tell me? This process, I think, is going to be a lot more useful starting from theory. Then we go get the data, uh, and we'll talk in some detail about uh, the different types and sources and ways of organizing that data uh, in step number three. But now we're off to the races, right? So now we start to apply our econometric techniques. We're running regressions, most likely, right? So we estimate our model, but we're still not done, right? We've got to put that model through a battery of diagnostic tests. Is it telling us what we think it's telling us? Is it the appropriate model to be estimating? Does it have various statistical issues with it? And based on the results of those diagnostic tests, we're probably going to go back to the drawing board, right? We're going to reformulate that model, uh, which is going to take various forms that we'll talk about. We're going to re-estimate it, and that's going to be this little hamster wheel of frustration, right? Of estimation, diagnostics, reformulation, re-estimation, re-diagnostics, etc. But then once we get a model that we are happy with, uh, and again, we'll have a very uh, specific set of criteria, right? Boxes that we have to check off and say, okay, now I think I can believe these results. Then we can test our key hypotheses, right? Does un do unemployment benefits rising actually cause a change in the level of unemployment? For example, with some statistical confidence, can we reject or not that hypothesis? And then the last step, also easy to, uh, to overlook, but crucial, right? I always say what separates you know, a statistician from an econometrician, it's step number eight, telling a story, right? Being able to usefully communicate the meaning of your results. So you really want to tie, so kind of step number eight should be tying back to step number one. So the interpretation of the results takes the page after page after page of statistics that come out of your data and tell a story, right? What is that data telling us? So if you can get to the end of that, congratulations, you are an econometrician, right? So now we want to start to kind of break down each one of those steps. So we'll look at steps one and two in this, uh, for the rest of this little video, and then uh, add the rest of them in the next installment, right? So when we as econometricians talk about theory, right, again, posing the question, really what we're talking about is the so-called data generation process the data generating process, the DGP. So that's terminology we'll be throwing around quite a lot. And again, all that is, is it's a proposed function that predicts a specific variable, our Y variable, our endogenous or our dependent variable. And it's predicted as some function, F of blank, a specific list of exogenous independent explanatory variables, that x1, x2, x3. So the idea being, if we know what the inputs are, the x1, x2, x3, and we know what the function looks like, we should be able to do a really good job of predicting what is actually going to occur, the y variable. So in the example that we're just kind of throwing around, if we're trying to predict the level of unemployment in the US economy month by month, 
unemployment would be our y variable. And then the x variable of interest might be get the level of unemployment benefits paid by the government. And then the rest of the x variables, x2 through xk, well, those would be all the other variables that, all the other factors that likely contribute to changes in unemployment, right? But the idea is that there is a finite list of variables that are going to be useful predictors, and there's a specific function that relates those things. As we say here, this is based on theory, but we don't, we never really know what that true data generation process is. This is what we might call, you know, faith-based econometrics, right? But we have to believe that there is a fixed function and a fixed set of variables that determines our outcome. And one way to think about our goal is we want to get as close to that function as possible. Okay, so that's our step number one theory, our data generation process. Uh, and again, as far as our notation and terminology, again, we're being a little bit simplistic here and naive, but the idea here is that what the variable that we've labeled as y is our only endogenous variable. That's the only variable that's determined within our model, right? And that is what we're trying to predict, okay? It can be predicted with those x variables. And everything else, everything that's in that function, those x variables, those are assumed for the moment to be our exogenous or fixed variables. So in other words, x1 doesn't change when y changes, or x1 doesn't change when x2 changes. Think of them as written in stone, they're fixed. We put them in the function and they predict what comes out. We don't have to think too hard about why that's not always gonna be realistic. But that's going to be our naive assumption for the moment. Okay, so once we've done that, and again, you're just kind of doing this in your head, it's pencil and paper. Once we have our y variable, we try to figure out what the most likely uh, scenario is for how it's determined. Then step two, formulating a model, uh, it's just formalizing a specific mathematical function. Right? And again, we're going to be fairly naive here initially, but our go-to assumption is that it's a simple linear formulation, right? That that list of x variables all predict y with a fixed slope parameter. And those are what those b terms are, right? The impact of x on y depends on the parameter in front of it, that value of b. And then note we also have a new term here that we'll spend a lot of time talking about this little u at the end, right? So our variable y is determined by these unknown parameters, the b0, b1, dot, 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 through bk, and then this list of observable explanatory variables, our x1 through x2, et cetera. Got our list of x's, and then there's this one extra term at the end, this ui. So let's think about what all of that means this proposed formalized model again on the left hand side of the equation that's going to be our dependent endogenous variable that's what we're trying to predict all of those x terms we know what those are those are the exogenous predictors the factors that determine y the b0 since it's not attached to a specific x variable well that's going to be our intercept or our constant and then each of those b1 through bk terms, all these guys here attached to an x variable, those, you know, we're gonna spend a lot of time on those guys, those are the marginal effects. Those are the specific partial relationships between each x variable and that y variable. For now, just think of them kind of from algebra one as your slope parameter. And then kind of the hero of our story eventually is gonna be this error term, also known as the residual, also known as the disturbance term. Okay, so that we didn't really have in the in the initial formulation. Um, so all we're doing there is recognizing that even if we know everything else, right, there's always going to be this portion of y that varies randomly that we're not going to be able to predict perfectly. So thinking about the pieces of that puzzle, um, again, there's, there's basically a couple different elements that we need to keep in mind when understanding what those 
what that notation represents, right? So the X and the Y, well, those are observable variables, right? That's the data that we're gonna capture. You can picture a spreadsheet, right? A column of observations, that's your Y. Unemployment month by month by month. Your X variable is, you know, the amount of unemployment benefits paid out, that's X1. X2 might be interest rates, X3 might be inflation, et cetera, et cetera. So anything that we can observe with data can play the role of an X or a Y, whereas the B0 through BK, those are the unknown parameters, right? We believe that they exist, that there is a way in which X affects Y. We just don't have numbers to plug in quite yet for what those, what those values are, right? So variables, observable data, X and Y, parameters, the Bs in the model, are unobservable, unknown relationships in that data generation process. And then the one that kind of straddles the, the two uh, possibilities here, the U, the error term, we think of that as a variable, right? It's a column in our spreadsheet that we would like to have, but we don't know it, right? We don't know for every month what is the change in unemployment that's unpredictable, right? So it's not a parameter, it's a variable. It's just a variable that we don't have access to. We'll estimate it, uh, but as far as gathering our data, that's not gonna be something that we have, okay? So where is all this taking us? Looking ahead, uh, we're gonna be quote unquote running regressions, right? Estimating the parameters in that prediction equation using the observable values of X and Y in our little spreadsheet, we want to estimate values of our parameters. And the method of estimation is simply going to be, well, what values of those parameters are going to make our model most accurate? Is going to leave that unexplained component, that error term U, as small as possible. So again, we're going to fill in all those blanks as we move, but that's where all of those pieces fit into the the big picture puzzle. So just as a, a simple example, I happen to pull a nice book off my shelf here, Development as Freedom by Amartya Sen. So if you're interested in economic development, that's always a good one. Um, and here on page 149, pretty much randomly, the, uh, the little chapter heading there is Democracy and Economic Growth, right? So Imagine you're skimming through the book and you come across that heading and say, wow, gosh, that is a good question. How is the economic growth of a country related to the political environment, the level of democracy uh, in how leadership is chosen? So our question might be something like this, right? If we want to explain why one country has economic growth higher or lower than another, so variation in economic growth is our dependent variable, and we want to know how much of that is explained by the level of democracy in that political environment? And then we would have a whole list, X2 through XK, of other likely explanatory factors that can explain growth, right? So basically, instantaneously, when we see that chapter heading and we say, oh, that's a good question, we formulate in our mind this possible data generation process. We might have some specific uh, ideas of what these other X variables might be as well, but that's going to be a good start. So that's step number one, simply taking a, a question and turning it into a possible data generation process. Uh, and then step number two is, again, for our simple purposes, just constructing a linearization of that relationship. So if democracy is our key variable, that's our X1 variable, we want to know what that B1 term is, right? When democracy increases, does that make a country likely to grow faster or slower? Or does it have no effect at all? Well, we need to know what that B1 is to answer that question. Okay. And once we have that, then we are on our way. So how do we get that value of B1? Well, that's the rest of that roadmap that we outline. Okay, so that's what we'll get into next uh, in the following video, but that's going to be enough for right now. Thanks.